Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger at the Linux Foundation. Uh, and we are halfway through our fifth anniversary panel series. It's amazing to believe Hyperledger, we've been uh, around for about five years. We've had great conversations so far in the, the panel series about the early days of Hyperledger, what kind of led to the formation of the organization and, and some, of, uh, some of the accomplishments that have uh, uh, arrived since then. Uh, last week, we had an, uh, 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 an event uh, actually on Asia Pacific time zones, focusing on our community there and in particular on trade finance, which was uh, really well attended and, and really interesting. Coming up next week, we have a conversation Conversation on central bank digital currencies and, and stable coins and the role that permission DLTs will play in that future. And then uh, we'll wrap it up uh, in the last week with two things, a panel on the next five years of Hyperledger, uh, as well as a networking event on the 17th, which is our proper birthday. So please join us for, for all of these different things. You'll find more information about this on the Hyperledger website. Uh, there's a page specifically about this five-year series. In fact, there's a link there to free swag, a t-shirt, shirts and, and a few other things uh, that you can uh, pick up. You will we'll have to pay for shipping. Uh, that's the one part we couldn't do for free, but um, pl please go there and, and, and pull down some swag as if we were there in person, being able to shoot t-shirts out of t-shirt cannons to all of you, uh, which I really wish we could. And perhaps we will do that for our sixth anniversary. Um, today, we're going to have a fabulous panel on disruption, uh, how enterprise DLT is really transforming some domains from climate to healthcare, to logistics, to, to really tackle some big issues around trust and global trade. Uh, we have some of my favorite members in the community on the on the call here today, uh, and perhaps the leading chronicler of enterprise of, of the enterprise blockchain space and compiler of the Forbes Blockchain 50, Forbes contributor Michael Del Castillo to moderate this panel. So at this point, Michael, I'll pass the baton to you and take it away. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's been great to get to know you. Uh, over the past couple of days as we've had um, sort of preparation calls for this. Uh, I think a, a lot of what we're going to talk about um, will be uh, how things have changed over the last five years, how the industry has matured and grown, and how um, what your customers and users are demanding has evolved. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that has changed most recently is we no longer kick these events off with the obligatory uh, what is a blockchain definition? I, I remember in the early days, we used to always have to talk about, well, what is a blockchain? Um, what is distributed ledger technology? What is the difference between DLT and blockchain? Um, but I think, you know, as a, um, a way to sort of give an homage to the, the, the past five years ago, um, we're going to start off with a quick definition of what is blockchain. Um, and the reason why I want to start there is because we have two very interesting visual examples of what a blockchain is on our panel today. Um, and so to sort of break the ice, I'd like to ask if Heather uh, and, and Martin um, could please just very briefly show us um, what a blockchain is. Um, and then uh, we, we, we had uh, some, a, a, a nice conversation earlier about what a blockchain is. And, just for the sake of uh, a historical homage, we'll talk about what is a blockchain. So Heather and Martin, why don't you show us your blockchains? All right, I'll, I'll go first and, and highlight my blockchain earrings for the camera, where you see interconnected blocks referencing a blockchain, a chain of blocks. That is my visual cue. <laughs> and Martin? Uh, absolutely. That's a great one. And, uh, and here's my other visual cues. So you can see that these are two blocks connected by a chain. The, the, the soft is made of wood. It's kind of, it, it, it grows. It's kind of the data. And here's the solid part that really connects that together. And uh, Gijo and, and Dale, with those uh, two visual representations of a blockchain, could we just give us a, a quick little overview? How do you describe what a blockchain is to your customers, your users, your investors, whatever the case might be? So, so to me, and I can go first, right? I mean, to me, blockchain is uh, nothing but a trust protocol. It actually enables trust uh, in a trustless environment where you don't need to trust any single party in the network, right? <clears throat> so it's very simple as that. And Dale, how do you describe it to your customers or users? I do it in five words. There's, there's a challenge. We'll see, we'll see what's here. Digital ledger, permanent, transparent, shared. Awesome. 
and uh, Brian, uh, what's the what's the problem with the word blockchain? I thought you had a fascinating observation on some of the difficulties of the word blockchain. Um, I, well, uh, first, I just want to make sure we we remember to introduce all of ourselves so that everyone yes. gets to know yeah, yeah, yeah. who all of us are. Okay, um, uh, and uh, no, I just uh, con the conceptual model of blocking and and being you know burdened by chains. It's as a marketing term. I mean, who thought of it? But you know, it, this is coming from the open source guy, and open source itself is a problematic term. And maybe we just accept that all of the community terms that we deal with are problematic in some way or another. But uh, in a way, I think blockchain has grown on us. When we feel like we need to put on a tie, we use the term enterprise DLT, enterprise ledger, distributed ledger, those sorts of things. But but I do think blockchain um, uh, is problematic, but has kind of earned its 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 uh, kind of keep in a way. So now that we've had our little icebreaker here, um, we'll go ahead and go around the room, um, uh, the virtual room. Uh, Martin, if you could just uh, tell us your, your, your name, your title, where you work um, and where you are. Great, uh, first again, thank you, Michael. Thanks, Brian and, and Hyperledger. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Martin Weinstein. I'm calling in from Los Angeles, California. I am the founder and lead scientist of the Yale Open Innovation Lab, program manager at the Digital Currency Initiative of the MIT Media Lab, which is my, my academic hat. Uh, I'm, I'm the founder and co-chair of the Hyperledger Climate Action Special Interest Group and the founder and executive director of the Open Earth Foundation, which basically is the vehicle that we use to spin off all of our, our projects in the real world. And Dale? Hi, I'm Dale Christie. I'm a business fellow and blockchain strategist for FedEx. I bring you greetings from Memphis. Heather? Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Flannery. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Consensus Health. I'm also the chair of the IEEE P2418.6 Standards Development Working Group for Blockchain in Healthcare and Life Sciences, the chair of the, uh, the HIMSS Blockchain Task Force, and the chair of the Healthcare Special Interest Group at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. And Gijo. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Gijo Joseph. I work for uh, uh, Chainyard. I'm the vice president for blockchain services. Chainyard is a company, services company based out of North Carolina in the US. And I live out of uh, a small city called Cochin in the Southern India. So uh, Gijo gets the prize for the, the latest meeting time. Um, I, now that we've kind of uh, got to know a little bit about who's here with us, um, I want to get started with why. Um, why are you here? Why, why Hyperledger? Why a uh, nonprofit uh, public organization like Hyperledger? Um, uh, in our, in our warm-up calls for this meeting, one of the things that really stood out to me was sort of some of the limitations that you guys face, maybe at the companies that you work for, maybe the companies you work with, but the limitations of uh, uh, for-profit private companies and why is it, what do you get out of joining, out of working with a public nonprofit entity? What's, what's the difference there for you guys? Yeah, I, can, I can go first. Um, it, I mean, there's, there's three things to me that resonate. One is the institution, the strong institution behind it uh, with the Linux Foundation to be able to carry out important projects, particularly in the governance uh, process the other part is, of course, the community. I mean, we had our, our, our Hyperledger forum and it was, it was very vibrant to see people working together and it's that really collaboration that makes it possible. The other one obviously is the underlying tech, but, but the three together are when one has to build on an open digital infrastructure that business sets on top of common standards, common protocols, common code, uh, it's, it's really the nonprofit that I think is best positioned to be able to be that neutral uh, partner when there's many different conflicting uh, multi-stakeholder uh, motivations. Heather, it's unusual for uh, technology to be um, associated with, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the nonprofit world. I feel like, you know, we talk about these sexy, high-tech, fancy, um, billion-dollar, trillion-dollar companies in the technology space. Um, what are the limits that you see with the, the for-profit space, and what brings you and, and Consensus Health and, and other similar organizations to a nonprofit world? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's a critical value alignment and acknowledgement of the intrinsic limitations of what a private for-profit can accomplish in an incredibly interconnected, complex, adaptive system that has as, as, as powerful and important stakeholders, humanity as individuals, 
governments, academia, and all of private industry. So, so the notion that um, any one corporation could introduce a product or service that could that that could turn enough levers and dials to to write all of the 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 distorted incentives and so on is simply unrealistic. And there's many important ways that we need to uh, collectivize our thinking and our action. Uh, and standards is one of those ways. Um, uh, burgeoning, vibrant, global open source communities is another one of those ways. Those are, you know, those have models for convergence as well. Uh, so I, I think that it's it's um, it's critical in my industry from a healthcare and life sciences perspective as well, because for any one private for-profit company's solution to actually reach adoption and scale, it actually has to prevent vendor lock-in in in parallel Mm. because Mm. our industry will will reject a solution that would that would repeat the kind of pain that they've experienced with with vendor lock-in in 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 previous paradigm shifts of technology so it's vital that that we have we have we create flexibility and choice and mobility even as we defend our proprietary value propositions uh, Gijo and Dale, you, you work for very definitely for-profit uh, companies here, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, and, and your customers are all, I would imagine, in large part for-profit. Um, talk to us a little bit about what brings you to a nonprofit organization. What do you get out of working with an open community um, as, as opposed to sort of the stuff that happens behind closed doors at a for-profit company? So, so I can go first, right? You know, so if you look at the, if you look at the uh, evolution of the, the blockchain platforms, right? I mean, we started with the public blockchain and uh, then when we are looking at an uh, enterprise level, right? So this Hyperledger, Hyperledger came at, at the beginning. And so we see, a, a, you know, more brains coming to a quicker convergence, you know, so that the technology actually get adopted uh, uh, very quickly, but at the same time, some big names like Martin said, some big names are you know, standing behind it to support that. That's exactly the, uh, the, the combinations, you know, these days and people looking, people looking at, it, especially in blockchain, it's not like a one company is working, it's a technology. I mean, the blockchain is for an ecosystem, right? There are, the blockchain is uh, for a, if you look at, you know, multiple companies are working to, together scenario. So in such scenarios, we find that uh, the, the open source kind of a environment where a good companies are backing up a solution works very well. Dale? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's helpful to share a little bit of our journey from that point of view. Again, by comparison to the rest of the panel, I'm on the business and strategy side. Um, and so my audience typically is not the technician, right? It's not on the technical side. And I have to figure out a way to go down the other path of that. So between that and the logistics environment and all that, here's how we got to that point. We certainly didn't come to that conclusion initially and then back in from there. In our own journey, um, you know, as, as all of us have talked about uh, blockchain to media and to, you know, panels and interviews and conferences back when we were all still traveling and all those kinds of things, um, we, you know, what we all saw. So if you go back, you know, you kind of did the five year thing. I've actually got on conference material. I kind of go back. Here's the last five years in 60 seconds. Right. Uh, you know, uh, hey, it's Bitcoin. We're all going to get rich. Hey, we're going to treat it like the Internet. Hey, 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 what's blockchain and all the rest of those kinds of things. Our journey has kind of followed that same pattern, which is we, you know, most people early on, I think we're treating blockchain like the internet, which is we can get a, a few smart folks, we can get together, we can sign non-disclosures, we can uh, lock people in a room and kind of slide pizza under the door uh, until they come out with something. And then, you know, traditionally in that case, FedEx would slap a logo on it and put it out to the, you know, to the world, right? And as a proprietary product. Well, that logic may work for five or 10 or 50 or a hundred or maybe even a thousand entities but the friction, the, the complexities of that relationship won't scale, we don't believe, in global commerce. So at global commerce level, it's 100,000 or multiple hundreds of thousands of entities down to a bicycle delivery company. And so the fork in the road from our point of view in our journey was, does that scale, yes or no? We believe no. We believe we hit a wall at that point from a global commerce point of view. 
On the contrary, if you could hang an open source license on the threshold of this now virtual global door, uh, you know, Apache or MIT or something and say, are you okay, could you use that? And if the answer is yes, come on in, we believe it just scaled globally. So that's a non-technical way of what Heather and others have just described, but we, we don't, it's not an altruistic thing from our point of view. We're in business to be in business, certainly. That's not the point. The point is we don't think it will scale without that. We think there's gonna be an open foundational layer and then there will be all kinds of proprietary things on top, much like a, my Android phone or whatever the case may be. So it wasn't an altruistic thing. It was a long journey that led us to some conclusions. And from that, I'm incredibly proud. Our CIO, Rob Carter, who's been in the position for many, many years, came out a year and a half ago at the Blockchain Revolution Global Conference and calmly said, we actually think in this case, open is the answer. And for blockchain to be transformative, it has to be bigger than FedEx. You mentioned two uh, interesting examples of how things have changed over the last five years. Um, one can be summed up in one word, which is scale. Um, five years ago, we were talking about proofs of concept and uh, prototypes and pilots. And to a large degree, we still are, let's be honest. Um, but increasingly, uh, we're, 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 we're talking about live um, implementations um, that are um, looking at problems associated with scale. Uh, the second thing you mentioned that I think is really interesting is that your CIO knows what a blockchain is um, and has uh, you know, an informed perspective. Uh, five years ago, the C-suite was not paying attention. The, the C-suite at big companies was not paying attention. Blockchain was happening in basements, in skunk works, uh, hidden off in the dark corners of enterprises that people didn't want to talk about. That's changed, and it's changed rapidly in the last two or three years, I think. Um, I, I'd love to open it up and just kind of uh, hear uh, an, an exchange of ideas between the panelists of, of what you've seen that most has changed since you've gotten involved. Um, it could be from a, a technical issues that you're overcoming uh, to demands of your users, your audience, uh, regulatory issues. What is the, 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 the single biggest difference between blockchain now and blockchain five years ago? Could I jump in on that one, Michael? Please, yeah. So, so just to kick it off, the, the thing that immediately comes to mind for me is that if we think about the conversations we were having in blockchain, say 2015, 16, even into 17, the, the whole focus of the discussion was on blockchain as a discrete technology and digging into all the intricacies of what it was and wasn't and needed to be and so on. The, the biggest single change that I'm observing right now is that it's, it's entirely about convergence at this point. It's blockchain's convergence with a number of other equally transformative, powerful emerging technologies and, and the whole discussion has a wider and deeper, wider aperture and more depth up and down a, a whole stack, not only at a trust protocol layer. And I can follow on that in, in you know, there's different things I can say, but, but I, often, I, I often mention that blockchain has helped people think in a different way. And so we're now able to talk about the system, which is the invisible part that connects us all. Uh, and it depends on, on where, which system we, we talk about. Uh, and so I, I, I bump uh, myself with high level folks at United Nations, World Bank, that understand the importance of developing infrastructure for managing a global system. And that, you know, they might, may not know the details, but they're like, blockchain has to be part of some of that infrastructure. And so it makes it very easy to be able to to talk in those terms. And it also uh, on thinking uh, about that, that systems level is the power of peer-to-peer, of -peer, which I think five or 10 years ago was something seen very much as a grassroots or, uh, and, and not as, as something where that can power business. And I think that that has changed a lot. Martin, could you expand just a little bit more on uh, what, what, what you mean by change the way that people think? Because um, I think that's just really crucial. How is a distributed system requiring people to change the way they attack problem solving? Yeah, I think I think it's probably similar to what what happened in the internet. I think that Brian probably can speak a lot more to it. Is that people were having a really hard time explaining what the internet was, and as a as because it's somehow invisible, but it's a but it's a vector that connects things, and when we talk about systems, it's, it's, it's not, it's, the total is more than the sum of the parts. So you need to be able to explain what connects those discrete objects. 
And, and, and so I think that it, it helps people visualize uh, that and that that itself requires an infrastructure, requires the trust between those, those parts. And so it, I think it also helps um, with business model ideas. Uh, the internet produced in the academic world a whole shift in, we didn't even talk about business models before the internet. But eventually we had to explain, how do you sell something that's free? And, and so it, it really helps people start thinking about new business models. And we've seen, I mean, the blockchain has powered so much entrepreneurship in the last five years. A lot of it fails, but that's normal. Yeah, Michael, if I, if I just add to uh, add two sentences. Now I see uh, a three-way transi transition happening, right? I mean, when I joined early days, uh, uh, blockchain was just Bitcoin. Right now, people will say, oh, that's just Bitcoin, right? I mean, second, as a, as a services company, the second thing transition, we see that you now people come to us, tell us, uh, uh, I need a blockchain, right? Now, they just come back saying, I, I want to put blockchain in my solution, right? I mean, they, don't, they never used to say what solution it is. But from there, in the last one year, what you got to see is like a, the clear understanding of business value of blockchain is coming up to people. You know, as an example, now nowadays people don't come to us say, I need a blockchain, but they come up with a, you know, more innovative ways of doing new business, like, like you know, that it could be as an example, real, real estate as a tokenization. And the people now coming with the, you know, those kind of business cases to us. So, so we see a, a understanding level of people has increased, uh, especially, you know, because blockchain requires both technology as well as business. And there's a good understanding of business is happening now. Michael, can I weigh in? Yep. So uh, back to Martin's points, um, I, I've spent many years in process improvement and in quality and in strategy. My brain connects dots. I'm not on the technical side, I'm on the business and strategy side, but my brain connects dots. And most businesses are simply just a series of processes. And one of the graphics, one of the visuals that I use, I've just pulled off the internet, which is a bunch of people handing sandbags to each other in a flood scenario, right? So if we envision that, you've got multiple people, I hand it to you, you hand it to Heather, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a, that's a business process. That's a, an analogy, a metaphor for a business process, basically. So, so part of the discussion around blockchain that he's referring to where we are now thinking differently is that certainly we can use blockchain as a process improvement involvement, right? So if there are this many steps in that process, and if I eliminate one of those steps, that's a huge percentage improvement. So I think process improvement is we're starting, we're starting to think in the last couple of years about process improvement, but that would be no different than digitizing a document into a PDF, right? That's a, that's a, that it is a step, but let's not limit ourselves into what we can think about. However, if peer-to-peer -peer technology, if you need a ride and I've got a car, then maybe a ride sharing app or something like that is a better mousetrap than the original currently models, but it's still a middleman that sits between supply and demand. And blockchain allows us to completely rethink that. That's breakthrough thinking, which is if you need a ride and I've got a car, comma, and we can find each other in a trusted environment like blockchain, that's a different world. And by the way, I would go one step further, which is I don't, you know, people ask all of us all these questions all the time. Well, what happened? Well, what if blockchain just doesn't come about? What, what if it's just all hype? This, I would argue that no matter where it goes from here, it has already changed the world. It has already changed the way we are able to think of issues and contemplate and consider and frees us up to go, wait a second, if you can do that, then why not this and et cetera, et cetera. Love it. Brian, did you have anything you wanted to uh, chime in with? Uh, yeah, I think you know the, the the parallels to kind of earlier days uh, I, uh, and earlier days specifically of open source software and to some degree the the internet kind of ring for me it, it used to be that we'd have to make the case for why uh, why a, a piece of open source software could be depended upon commercially by uh, collections of organizations um, uh, just you know by itself and then an even higher uh, challenge was convincing them that they there was value to them and actually uh, feeding the whatever bug fixes and contributions and such back into a pool now that's become a much easier more commonplace kind of thing um, people understand companies understand why to do that uh, but the whole web 2.0 cycle was about uh, companies saying we want to be platform providers, we want to be the Uber of this or the Airbnb of that, 
uh, getting VC funding to say, hey, we want to be this central infrastructure. And DLT technology, blockchain technology kind of says you don't have to do that. You can take a collection of organizations with a common interest in sharing information and, and conducting transactions. And um, you might need a lightweight governance kind of organization to help facilitate that, but no one has to own the center of that and play God in the center of that ecosystem. And that's, that's a revelation. That's still something that a lot of companies are not getting, but I'd say a big difference between now and five years ago is that no longer feels like a like an alien concept or an impossibly idealistic concept now that people can map that to oh no there's consortia in all of these different industries who've been doing standards and 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 such who now can be a governance organization or, or perhaps new kinds of organizations uh, I, 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 around these blockchain activities and that's more accepted and normal uh, than than this pie in the sky kind of idea from five years ago I remember that it was an easy way to talk about it um, that working together could create efficiencies that would save money. Um, but people weren't, you know, a lot of these big businesses are more in the business of making money um, than they are in saving money. And it was kind of a difficult sell to some organizations about, you know, is, is, is saving money by working with my competitors worth all of the effort. Um, and uh, I, I like something that Dale said about the sandbag metaphor there. Um, because uh, the, the sandbag metaphor um, paints a picture of people who are uh, not thinking about um, long-term benefits. They're not thinking about uh, sort of uh, strategic impact of working with their neighbors. Uh, they're building a dang wall to, to keep a flood back, right? Um, and we recently had uh, a real world example of a flood in the form of COVID-19. Um, and I'll, I think a lot of these questions about whether or not fixing these inefficiencies in the system was worth all of the effort were laid bare by COVID-19. And all of a sudden you were seeing people rushing with their sandbags to try and shore up the walls of the global supply chain and, and many, many other areas. Um, I'd like to uh, open it up to the whole group to, to ask if you could shed a little bit of light on both the positive ways and maybe some of the negative ways uh, that COVID-19 has changed the way that your organization, your customers, or you personally are dealing with blockchain. I'll jump in here. Um, I'd, I'd like to react to that by first building on something that Dale was, was commenting on. And, and I would summarize it by two categories of value creation, one optimization and a second transformation. And we can see opportunities in COVID-19 for optimization. And we have new transformative possibilities that are, that are also being created. I think that um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is that there is an emerging discipline that is made possible by this technology. And I'll, I'll, I'll name it and call it applied behavioral economics, which gives us the, the first, the first collective human infrastructure by which we could hypothesize about some set of incentives in a complex system. We could implement a model and then iteratively adapt and optimize to what we're actually seeing in the complex system. That, that's, a, that's an optimization case that, that has extraordinary potential. And we talk so much about distorted incentives as being the reasons why the healthcare and life sciences industry and its data silos are so, so, so distorted and polarizing in, in the way that they engage one another. Um, longer term, we have the potential to use AI plus blockchain in the classic scenario of optimization in the model of, of modifying incentives and iterating quickly based on, based on being able to facilitate all of that. There's never been that capability in all of human history. That, that is, it's completely new. So bring uh, that back really specifically to what's, what's going on as a result of COVID. Yeah, so with COVID, we've got, um, let's say the first half of the, of the COVID-19 problem space is oriented around uh, around supply chain, around around PPE, around the uh, the brittleness in those supply chains, and the inability to have visibility and transparency to real world uh, information, real world evidence immediately. Uh, those those were problem spaces that we would have been able to make a massive impact 
uh, on the pandemic if our whole blockchain world and healthcare had been able to move forward faster. Uh, the, fr frankly, the we missed the deadline uh, in terms of being able to realize those value that value in real time at the beginning of the pandemic, and it will, however affect us on, on taking future epidemics and preventing them from turning into pandemics. I'm confident of that. Is there, a specific, a, project, is there well, a specific project in Consensus Health that you'd like to highlight that is currently in development that in future pandemics might have some sort of an impact? I'll speak to that at a high level in, in terms of the, the back half of the problem space of the pandemic. And that includes uh, vaccination, immunity, therapeutics, um, all the way to the, the data management problem of test data management, vaccination data management, immunity status data management. And, and ultimately that brings you back to something that I believe in very strongly as, as, as a blockchain enabled part of our future state, which is a person-centered infrastructure with sovereignty, agency, dignity, privacy that is made available to humanity generally. And that the power for that in enabling things like everything from clinical trials matching to precision medicine, to the coordination of care across organizational boundaries and beyond, ultimately it's not blockchain at the center, it's the human being at the center and, and a new class of infrastructure that facilitates that human being it being able to um, aggregate and curate and ethically monetize that information about themselves that is constantly expanding. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there, but that transformation of, of the person in the center and their empowerment and their freedom and their privacy and their agency is at the heart of a huge constellation of healthcare and life sciences uh, relevant use cases. And I'm happy to continue, Michael, on on sort of at least my my reaction to, to COVID. Um, so like at Heather, in some sense, my work focuses on the Earth system. Like that's that's in my in my center. It's like let's let's not destroy this. Uh, climate's a key part of that. Um, and I think there's been three aspects to uh, to how COVID affected our work on climate. The first one's quite quite straightforward. At the beginning of the year, Australia was on fire. Climate was the important news of the year. That was where we needed to focus on. And then after that, with COVID, it was very hard to mobilize capital, attention, resources to climate space. Uh, I think things are changing a little bit more, but that was one of the things that was, was quite obvious. The second one, um, more on the positive side, in the sense that we now realize that we are a highly globalized uh, civilization, but we're definitely not orchestrated and organized. And, and unless we have that open digital infrastructure to help us work together, where the total is more than the sum of the parts, where we can do a lot of sense making, we're just not going to address these macro challenges. And therefore we might peril as a, as a civilization. And uh, so we, we now have to build infrastructure to be able to cope with these large scale uh, impacts. And I think COVID brings that example straight up in our faces that climate has a harder time because climate has a lot more latency. Uh, you know, there's an impact and it takes a while and COVID is, is, is very strong. And then I think the last point, thing I wanna say is we now have an imperative, uh, not just of what happened with COVID, but what happens afterwards, which is the economic um, uh, impact that it has, is we have to create jobs, we have to create green jobs, tackle climate and job creation at the same time. Of course, climate change and the transformation of our entire energy infrastructure is the most interesting new deal we can have. We have to rebuild our infrastructure, but we also have to rebuild our digital infrastructure. There's a lot of remote, green, friendly jobs. And so that, that's a that's an important uh, horizon uh, ahead in infusing both both challenges. Hi, Michael. Uh, just to uh, reflect from Chania, right? Uh, so we have a uh, solution called Trust Your Supplier in, in the procurement space, right? So this is a digital identity of a supplier that can be cross-utilized across uh, multiple buyers. So we had the solution running, and when the, in the March, when this COVID hit the United States, right? So uh, the supply chain is one, typically when pandemic such thing happened, the supply chain is one get hit first. So hospital, we found hospitals uh, struggling to procure quality and essential PPE equipment. And the, mostly the avail availability was uncertain and we had quality in questionable and you know, supply, the trust on suppliers are eroding. And like Heather said, uh, 
since we had a platform available with us you know we and ibm immediately joined together say that how do we improve the trust in this pp procurement so we had the trust of the suppliers in the trust your supply solution and availability and inventory available in ibm sterling solution so we jointly leverage these two put together a rapid supplier connect and introduce in the market and within 6 weeks more than 500 buyers and suppliers started buying that right i mean using this platform so which uh, gave us the uh, the confidence there are few things one the trust is the paramount important factor when a, a such pandemic happens right you need to have system and trust does not come not from the block chain it you need to have the ecosystem created so we had uh, companies like dun and broadsheet we had companies like you know thomson reuters you know we have uh, other companies like uh, cdax rapid rating they all joined this ecosystem to create that the, the, that end to end trust and that's from the product solution on the solution side something we found is covid has accelerated digitization we see that you know all levels from enterprises to government and and we see that the uh, the people in the past looked uh, as an example voting using blockchain they they were very hesitant now they started looking at that we have seen people looking at vaccine you know track if we even there is a case came to us saying that like you know track the uh, uh, the food delivery you know how much uh, traffic it has increased you know put a blockchain solution so that you know they they wanted to trust in the system right so opening the borders was an another example like came to us like you know when people crossing the borders they wanted to show a trusted uh, certificate of uh, covid clearance right so so we see an increasing adoption digitization and uh, more focus on on blockchain with covid that's interesting that you mentioned an increase in interest in voting applications as a result of a pandemic um could you connect those dots a little bit more concretely how how did the pandemic um contribute to an increased interest in voting Be- because people are we don't want people to travel during this uh, pandemic right we don't want people to come and stand in the line at the same time uh, especially remote traveling in this very specific case which came to us was uh, uh, they don't want uh, people still voting from the phones but they could go to like you know small so many different location even outside their state an example is one state is voting you know i don't need to go back to that state i can vote from a different state from a different location but still a predefined polling booth but that booth will be like you know we can have mul- that booth will be in a outside jurisdictional jurisdictional area any other variables uh, there uh, maybe in the united states uh, voting system that you want to talk about no 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 not now <laughs> this is not the platform of that okay but but Michael, i'm going to jump in on that, that on your video, please do <laughs> yeah i i want to go back to the to the uh, the original question here was around covid and some of the changes and things like that as i said earlier my brain connects dots so we connect into the fork in the road which we don't think global commerce scales which led us to open which open is inevitable right which led us to the cio all those kinds of things but that concept which is the longer we focus on individual profits and proprietary solutions around here i think we think it actually slows down the adoption of blockchain so it's not altruistic it's a this is the way to go and if we the, the quicker we can all work together to do that we think that accelerates all kinds of things that led me to a word i've been using for a couple of years which is coopetition and coopetition initially you know we had to have conversations with the legal team wait a second that's an antitrust discussion no it's not there's hard fast lines with antitrust we're not going to get anywhere close to that that is not the point here it's simply michael and dale heather and dale and others finding out it's not about where we compete it's about where we can agree and there and that's a big space right we could all talk about safety we could all talk about a number of things from that point of view one of the examples that i mentioned in in our previous call is that we are part of a uh, an association called the global express association that only has three members fedex ups and dhl almost nobody knows that however we all agree where can we agree we are certainly competitors but where can we agree we can agree that reducing friction across borders we win our customers win and global trade also wins and so a tangible example of that is that last year a year ago we worked on a position paper together the three of us that we uh, for blockchain and emerging technologies that we provided to world customs organization and later to world trade organization. So that's a tangible example where where can it's not where we compete it's where we can agree. So where can we agree that's an example of that. 
However, now we pivot into the, into the virus, right? So a year ago, you and I could have been arguing across the back fence you know, in Long Island or whatever the case may be about our favorite sports teams or about something else that may, may have seemed important at the time, but in the big scope of things, we very quickly found out a few months later was not at all important. So cooperation or this shared purpose, where is a shared purpose? And now we've been talking about that. Now we all dropped everything and we are no longer arguing about the Celtics or the this or the whatever the example may be. Now we're all working together. We're instantly dropping everything to pick up that sandbag or in this case, to work through finding PPE, legitimate and authentic PPE, by the way, that brings blockchain back into that or ventilators or many, many, many other things. And so while I've been using coopetition as a blockchain reference primarily, it is absolutely not limited to blockchain. It is a broad cultural thing. And, and you could argue that it's an optimization. Where else could a company like FedEx or ABC or anybody else be more efficient? Many of them are fairly mature, but by working together, again, as I think Martin said earlier, you know, the sum of the parts, it, the total is greater than the sum of the parts. We can work together and find something that elevates all of us to the next level. We're seeing that with the front row seat right now from COVID in terms of health and uh, PPE and other very important types of things and soon to be vaccines. But it's a broader concept. Again, as I would say, blockchain is a technology discussion, but it's not only a technology discussion. And a lot of what we've been talking about right now is really cultural. It's not really the technology, it's not in the R&D department, it's the broad focus of who are we as good corporate citizens and what else can we do by working together? And we're seeing that play itself out uh, real time in the COVID. So I wanna uh, take that and address a question directly to Brian. Um, uh, I actually, uh, on, on a personal note, I don't agree to um, moderate many events at all that are run by uh, organizations that I write about. Um, I just I knew I need to make sure that I, I keep that that separation and I don't want the appearance of endorsement and me participating in this is by no means an endorsement of Hyperledger. But one of the things that, you know, gives Hyperledger an exception to a degree with me is that it's nonprofit and that it exists by its very nature to get competitors to work together and, um, you know, talking, you know, taking a, a, a cue from Dale, by the way, Dale, you're giving me a lot of good transitions. I appreciate that. Um, taking a, a cue from Dale on, 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 you know, working with competitors and, uh, you know, that this isn't altruistic, um, you must have one of the um, uh, broadest perspectives of what competitors working together looks like in the blockchain world. Um, and you've been conducting that complicated uh, interaction between competitors for five years. Um, have you seen, let like, me rephrase that, uh, what have you seen that has changed um, with that broad perspective? Your, your, your membership has, has uh, been over 200. I'm not sure where it's at right now. Um, many of those represent direct competitors. Uh, what, what's changed over the last five years as these competitors are learning to work together or maybe not work together? That's a really good question, uh, and I and I do sometimes refer to what I do and other other uh, uh, peers of mine at the Linux Foundation who are you know, leading these other projects as nerd diplomats, uh, because at one level it is about helping the developers figure out how to work together, uh, which is it has its own challenges. You know, uh, as a <clears throat> a developer, when you've got a clear concept of what you want to build, you sometimes don't want to deal with the noise of having to like take a lot of people's other voices into account. Um, <laughs> or have to read up on what somebody's already built. Uh, so sometimes you end up building something already, something somebody that already is built. Um, but uh, but there are ways to to deal with that, and it's about driving common purpose amongst the developers. Uh, and and actually, the good developers don't want to reinvent the wheels; they want to build upon what other people have done. So finding them, empowering them, giving them courage to to kind of participate publicly. Which in 2020, participating publicly in an open source project is a little more fraught than it was when I got started in 1995. The the risks of being wrong and and having somebody see that you were wrong feels a lot more real than back when it was just uh, a couple you know what it felt like a couple thousand of us on the internet um the I, uh, and then there's a right? second tier which is sorry what are the benefits of being right 
uh, the ben, well, and they're huge, top. right? Uh, because you know that you know, that forms essentially your alternative CV, right? You know, uh, people these days, if you're a developer, your GitHub uh, history is far more important than your LinkedIn uh, profile. Um, uh, so that's that's one level of it, and that can help certainly, and especially if you're shown as a developer to be uh, uh, positive in your communications and and collaborating with other people, that reflects well on your employment prospects. So so all those cases can be made, but it's also really when you've got someone very passionate about how to build a thing, how do you get them to share that passion and find room in that passion for, for other people, um, especially ones that are not sitting like close to or don't work with at the same company. Um, but, uh, but that's a, a, a both an, a science and an art. Um, and then the second tier is really getting the companies back to your original question to find common cause and work together. And you know, blockchain does that kind of inherently, right? Most use cases do involve these multi-party kinds of processes, uh, taking uh, middlemen out of the equation for sure, but also uh, uh, kind of standardizing and routinizing a lot of things that today have resisted digitalization because of the resistance and trust, right? So we have members in Hyperledger that represent healthcare companies and banks and end user organizations. And we've found that bringing them in and, and having them tell stories and having them meet each other and, and meet with the technology companies in a more neutral field uh, is, is a way to pierce through some of these uh, competitive concerns. Uh, so much so that, you know, with Hyperledger, we focus very much on the, the, the software and left it up to everyone else to build their own networks and, and go and, and, and uh, I, I kind of figure out how to put these pieces together around specific use cases. But we're starting to see a call uh, to uh, participate as kind of a, a governance authority on some of these networks in the long term. Um, we put up a, a page to talk about this and how, you know, modeling not just after how the Linux Foundation has built these communities, but also how organizations like ICANN or the, the CA browser form, which manages the TLS root uh, uh, infrastructure, um, uh, are pr practicing this kind of what's the smallest thing we can all agree upon so we can build a, a bigger network together. Um, so, and, and we think that's pretty Im important as to be connective to issue in, in, in many of these industries. So you, you, you know what, Michael, uh, I, just have yeah, to please, and, I just have to interrupt and say, Brian, if you were a, if you were a political leader on Capitol Hill driving positive bipartisan policy change, you would be so amazingly effective. Your leadership style in those those kinds of polarizing discussions, I'm just saying you may should you know reconsider. I, I worked in DC for two years and I don't think I'd last a, a week in the current environment, <laughs> but I appreciate the vote of confidence. Thank you. Because <laughs> it does require I good faith. I want to nominate Brian for a political position. Um, I, please please don't. Actually, please. Um, we actually, I want to get to um, some questions that have been submitted by our, 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 our listeners, our, our, our audience. Um, so I'm going to interrupt there. And, uh, you know, we, we did talk a bit about the impact of COVID-19. And, you know, I think one of the things that... I, I, you all could agree on uh, if you read between the lines is is that it reminded us that we live in a borderless world um and that uh that pandemics are not controlled by borders and and in fact they remind us that the borders are created by us um you know one of our uh, audience members um jason uh asks uh, we've seen some cool open technologies that offer interoperability for permissioned ecosystems um, do you see this as the next big step in order to share data in most company solutions you see built on Hyperledger today? Uh, th this, this question of interoperability, I think, is really at the core of um, some of the things that COVID reminded us. Wh wh where do you see the future of interoperability? Uh, I, 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 going back to the COVID uh, situation, and obviously in, in my case, Earth and Climate, uh, the challenges are actually attractors to interoperability solutions. Uh, so they're actually helping drive them uh, more than anything else. Um, so uh, they're in some sense, the, the macro challenges, the, let's say the borderless challenges are, are, are pushing us to drive the interoperability solutions. Um, that's one, one thing that I think is, is encouraging in some sense. And the climate space, of course, every carbon or CO2 um, a molecule that we pump out, it doesn't, doesn't derive from a, a, of a border. It all ends up in the atmosphere. It's a single jurisdiction that we all share. Uh, so how do we manage that? And at the same time, we have companies that have, obviously want to have their permission registries and permission accounting and the inventories at the national level and the UNFCCC level. So as soon as we start looking at this in the, in the climate space, without interoperability, we're going to have keep track uh, of, of different atmospheres, but uh, not, not a single one. 
Uh, and so um, I, I'm hoping that these wicked problems that we're facing, and obviously this is, this is my, my, my day to day, actually helps the, the, the technological folks working on those interoperability uh, solutions actually have a shared purpose. If we don't derive them, we can't address these macro problems because those we are all stakeholders of addressing COVID, addressing climate. Thank you, Martin. So Jerry asks, um, doesn't blockchain uh, doesn't blockchain enabling the data make it more difficult, maybe impossible to ensure privacy? Well, that that uh, that's just bait for me. Uh, so so the uh, <laughs> I'm going to address I, it to you directly. I thought absolutely. You were <laughs> This is, this is where another family of emerging technologies that I'll refer to as privacy in depth that's converging with blockchain is, is on that critical path. Blockchain as a discrete technology independent of other, of other technologies, you're absolutely correct, Jerry. Uh, but when it's converged with uh, zero knowledge cryptography and also hardware-based confidential computing modalities, such as represented by the Confidential Computing Consortium, also under Linux Foundation. Uh, those those uh, combinatorial processes where the data itself is in tightly coupled off-chain storage and compute infrastructures that are also part of a new infrastructure layer. I'm not necessarily talking about in enterprise systems. And then uh, one, other, one other quick point is with respect to interoperability, uh, I, think, I think it's important as we're conceptualizing private blockchain networks to, to not build great big giant new silos. And that uh, the, there is a role, a critical role for neutral public infrastructures in the form of public blockchains that are, and it, it's, it's not a competition between private versus public. There are, there are certain capabilities and discoverability uh, that, is, that is critical and possible with a neutral public blockchain, a permissionless blockchain that can allow discoverability and onboarding of private networks that could be conceived of as side chains. Those private networks also have to have hierarchical relationships. And regardless of the protocol and interoperability of the protocols themselves, that way of conceptualizing how those networks need to work and be able to roll up to something neutral and public uh, is, is a critical mental model, I think. Great. great answer. Great question, Jerry. If you want to do any more research on this, you're looking for zero knowledge proofs. Do a Google search for zero knowledge proofs and look into that. It's really counterintuitive. Um, but I think uh, to Heather's point, there are some technical breakthroughs and honestly, some mathematical breakthroughs that might go far beyond blockchain and might not be fully appreciated for decades um, that are resulting from this industry and particularly from that space. So uh, do, do your research there, Jerry, great question. Um, uh, moving on, um, Patrick asks, uh, what poli I love this because I, I, I love the idea of um, audiences getting involved and of, of readers getting involved. So what policies can local citizens start advocating for to their local municipal governments to ensure effective implementation of these new and emerging business models. To reiterate, what policies can local citizens start advocating for uh, for this, this emerging business model? Dale, go for it. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And um, as I said, the process improvement and the connect the dots thing helps me do two things. One is drill down into the depths of that question. But basically one of the things that I've learned and, and is I can't ignore at this point is the luxury that I have to work for a company that goes to 220 countries and territories. So essentially our default position from blockchain and many other things is essentially the International Space Station. And from that level, there's no FedEx, there's no industry, there's no borders. So data knows no borders, right, from that point of view. So it gets to the broad concept, the broad point of this question, but yet, you know, how do you, how do you address it locally? I think the answer is both. I've been involved with multiple states in the US that are trying to solve for that. Tennessee had an effort, uh, we started a couple of years ago working through that to try to understand how do you get some combination of academia, big business and government to work together. Again, where can we agree? The co-opetition piece kind of a thing, where can we agree? And that gets you to economic development, it gets you to jobs, which gets you to uh, the academia piece, what classes are we providing, what skills are we providing, et cetera, et cetera. I also worked earlier this year with South Carolina. There's a number of people in the US that are all trying to solve this from that point of view. 
And one of the challenges is we don't really still have a single definition at the U.S. government level, right? We're working with U.S. Customs, Department of Homeland Security, FDA. There's a number of people. But even at that level, we haven't solved it yet. So there's, there's a lot of movement going there. Locally, I think one of our challenges for this group and this audience is just defining blockchain, right? We all had different definitions of blockchain, um, but locally it's it's even a, a wider spread probably in terms of what is it and how do we do that? So I would identify people, whether that's a local Congress person or whatever that may be, to, to bring that up, to get those things up. If you take a look at the 50 states, there's a number of in initiatives that are working their way through legislation right now that are either already there for Wyoming and many other states or are coming up to there. So it's a slow build. It's hard to build, but it's going to be critical for us to move this thing forward, uh, not only locally, but at state level and also at a, at a U.S. government level. So uh, to wrap things up here, I wanted to end with a question by a student. Um, and the reason why I wanted to end with that is uh, just to give a, a quick little story. I know the moderator is not supposed to talk, but I've got just an anecdote here I want to share. Um, one of my good friends is a developer um, who can more or less estimate when you started learning to write code based on how elegant the code is. Um, people who start learning to code when they're children tend to write much more elegant, simple solutions. And those who uh, write code, learn to write code when they're older, you know, it's a little less intuitive and there's occasionally longer, less elegant solutions. Um, I've always been excited at the idea of seeing what coders do who were born into a blockchain world. Um, to a degree, you know, uh, us adults, you know, we're all rushing to learn this with quasi hardwired brains and, you know, even the most open minded of us are, are still learning a second language. Uh, blockchain natives are going to attack these problems completely differently than us. And so to end things with um, a student question, uh, Mohit uh, is a third year undergraduate student and Mohit asks, um, what are the differences between the different blockchains um, and how should I learn about them? Should I start with the developer course first or go elsewhere? Brian? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 all the great developers that I know have been largely self-taught. You know, even if they took classes in college, even if they uh, you know, had some formal training. Uh, uh, they they approached it from a linguistics point of view, or from a, uh, I, um, you know, even an artistic point of view. But um, uh, a lot of them were the ones who, uh, you know, saw, you know, approached the problem as an end user, not as somebody being paid to solve a problem. Uh, and so I think. I think what we'll see is these blockchain use cases driving different perspectives on the developers and 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 the people climbing that learning curve. And I can't wait to see what the results of that are. So yeah, I mean, I'm, we being a just Michael, just to add to that. Now, we being a we being a services company, right? We we get a lot of developers out there, right? We are hiring all the time. So so I completely agree with Brian. You don't start with the blockchain. You 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 get your fundamentals straight. You know, you know your fundamentals right, right? So the blockchain is just just like a you know, if just like another, you know, platform you are learning, right? But but if you have the fundamentals right, it, it's very easy for uh, you know and le learn something new. And we hire people with the good fundamentals. We don't specifically look for blockchain. Dale, any closing thoughts on the future of blockchain and uh, students learning? Oh, I'm incredibly excited. I'm incredibly optimistic about it. Again, I would tell you the world is these business processes. You don't have to, whether you're a developer or a business student, whatever the case may be, um, if you can understand those processes, trust me, I agree with the creative uh, discussions that Brian and others just had, you'll figure this out. You're gonna find a way to do it better, more efficiently using blockchain and other emerging technologies. And I can't wait to see how you do that. So what are you waiting for? Let's go. Heather, no pressure, but would you like to take a stab at closing words? Oh my goodness. I, I would say that uh, for, for young people considering moving into STEM fields generally, uh, I loved what you had to say, Michael, talking about uh, elegance and think, think of technology also as poetry and discover the simplest and most expedient means to solve problems that matter most. And if you, if you focus on those, those big audacious goals and, and force yourself to, to think differently, you'll be able to do extraordinary things. So Mohit, maybe uh, to, to sum it all up, um, don't start with the blockchain, but start with what you're most passionate about. 
and pursue that. And if it takes you across blockchain, so be it. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, this was an awesome talk. Um, a special thanks to Gijo for joining us at midnight. I hope you uh, can Thank unwind you. and, and uh, get some sleep tonight. And looking sure. forward to seeing what you all do over the next five years. You all have my email address. I expect inside scoops um, on all your big projects. Um, and I look forward to learning what happens next. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you Michael. Thank you, guys. Bye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.